Okay, we're going to talk about steam. Now, steam is a really valuable industrial material. It's relatively cheap to make. It's clean. We, we know we've been knowing how to make it for a very long time. Um, it's environmentally very friendly. If it has an accident or it leaks, it doesn't contaminate things, particularly if you're in the food industry and so on. So it's got a lot of value. And it's also, most important, has a huge amount of energy. If we look at some materials like mercury, copper, steel, aluminium and so on, this is the amount of energy to convert a kilogram of this material from 20 to 100 degrees. So you can see that mercury is very easy to heat up. These metals are a little bit higher, air is a little bit more, but water is four times that of air. In other words, it takes four times as much energy to heat the water and of course you're going to get it back when the water cools down. Remember it's a two-way thing. Same thing here for the steam. But remarkably the steam is 2,592 kilojoules of energy at 100 degrees. Now you say, well hang on, this is 100 degrees, so why do we have water and steam? Well this is water which is like just about to boil, and this is steam which has just been completely turned to steam. So this is the phase change. So it's around about um, 2,700, 2,800 kilojoules of energy can, required to get water from 20 degrees to steam. So it's a lot. Just to remind us, specific heat and latent heat, sensible heat. Your sensible heat is the heat which is required to change a temperature, and your latent heat is the heat required to change a phase. So remember, sensible heat changes temperatures, and latent heat changes phase. And that could be solid to liquid and liquid to gas. It's true for anything. In the case of water, of course, it's ice, water, and steam. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little thought experiment. So we're going to, we're going to make a a piston, sort of like a syringe if you like, and we're going to put some water on the bottom, and we're going to put a little floating piston up here, so if there's any pressure built up, this can rise up and show us the changes in volumes and pressures. Now at 80 degrees, we just got hot water. If we heat that to 100 degrees, we're going to start generating steam. So the steam is going to expand, and it's going to start to push our little piston up. So we've still got water, and we've got steam. So this is our piston. I'll just maybe colour that like that. And this is moving up. If we continue on with that experiment, as we heat it up, we're going to get to a point where about a half the water has been turned to steam. It's still at 100 degrees, and then finally the whole thing will have been completely turned to a gas. So it's 100% steam, there's no water left, and the volume is increased by about 1,700 times, so that one kilogram of water gives around about 1,700 litres of steam. So that's, that's a pretty big increase in, in, in volume. Um, if you go beyond this point, then your steam is a gas and you'll heat it up even further. Let 
And we've got a name for this. We call this superheated steam. Now, just going back for a moment, we need to remember that enthalpy is equal to energy plus work. Or we can rewrite that like this. We say that, in, that heat energy minus work is going to be equal to enthalpy in minus enthalpy out. This, this is a, a typical sort of thing you need to think about when you're balancing up energies inside a system like this. And there's also another little unit here which we should remember. This is very, very commonly used in engineering. It's called specific enthalpy. And specific enthalpy is pretty much the same thing, except that it's enthalpy divided by the mass. It's sort of a bit like, you know, miles per hour, that kind of thing. It says enthalpy divided by mass. Specific enthalpy. Now, when we transfer heat to steam, we've always got to think we've got a change in volume. So these are enthalpies. When we're using specific enthalpies, we can happily write that the energy is going to be equal to the mass times the enthalpy in minus the enthalpy out. Or, in other words, the heat flow. So it's going to be that is equal to the mass times enthalpy in, specific enthalpy in minus specific enthalpy out per second. I've written time, but it would typically be per second. Now, we move along here. We have these tables called steam tables, and we'll see those in a second. And some of you will have done the Marcy boiler, and you're actually generating a little part of the steam table. The point of the steam table is just an easy way to look up how much energy is contained in water under various conditions. Now, I'm going to do a little experiment, which little experiment's the, the one over here. I'm going to start this one off. Imagine I've got some water. Now here's a graph of temperature versus time, and I'm heating the water up. So first of all, and let's say for example it's at zero degrees. So this is very cold water, it's just melted ice. So we now have heat, 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 and it gets to 100 degrees. Now it starts to turn to steam. It goes constant temperature, so this here is sensible heat and this is latent heat being poured into here. This is the heat. I've written it as time, but it's actually enthalpy or heat going in. And then finally all the water here is turned to steam and if we've captured it in one of those containers the temperature will now start to rise again because it's all a gas and we're just heating a gas. We write this. The enthalpy of this transition is equal to the enthalpy of the gas minus the enthalpy of the fluid. So Hg equals gas enthalpy I, of course I mean specific enthalpy, and HF equals fluid. Or we can call that water, and we can call that steam. And if we combine those two, then the transition between the two is that minus that. Right, we'll see in a moment how this all fits together. This is important. The enthalpy of a kilogram of steam is 2676 kilojoules per kilogram. 
and the enthalpy of saturated water. This is water which is just about to boil. So that's water which is sitting on that point there on the curve. That is 419. kilojoules per kilogram. Alright, so let's go over the page then and see how this all starts to tie together energy-wise. So what we're doing here is we're, we're taking a kilogram of water and we're heating it up. So let's go and do this again. And it's one of those sealed containers, very much like the Nasi boiler, where you're keeping track of all the bits. So I'm going to change this axis down here to enthalpy. And this is still temperature. So we're going to start at zero degrees. This is just a reference point. It could be any temperature. And we're going to go up to 100. This takes 419 kilojoules of energy. If we started at 50, it would be half of that. be about 210. If we started at 80, it would be about 300 and something kilojoules of energy. So the amount of energy required to go from whatever the temperature is up to 100 is just that proportion of that. So we've got some water and we've heated it up and it's now saturated liquid. And this saturated liquid is now going to start giving off steam, lots of steam. So it gives off a lot of steam and it takes 2,257 kilojoules to turn one kilogram of water to steam. So that's the enthalpy, the energy required to do that. Once you've got that, no water left, this is a saturated vapour, and then the gas will start to increase in temperature again, because you're just heating a gas. Now it's a thing called the dryness factor. And the dryness factor is just simply how far you are along this line. So if I'm talking about dryness, if I'm, say, there, it's 50%. If I'm there, well, I'll say 20%, 80%. And the amount of energy to make the steam, and this is probably the most important thing, just depends on how far you are along here. So for example, if I had water at 50 degrees and I wanted to make 50% dry steam, then to turn this up to 100 degrees, So that's a little bit there. And then do 50% dry steam. That's going to be a half of this. Halfway along here, a half of that. So the total amount of energy contained in 50% dry steam would be this, plus that. What about that? That's actually 209.5, but I was a bit lazy with that. So that's going to be around about 13, 38 kilojoules of energy per kilogram for 50% dry steam. If I wanted to go all the way to 100% dry, it would be that, 2257 plus that. If I started at a lower temperature, this would be bigger. If I started at 20 degrees, it's going to be 0.8 of that. If I started at 0 degrees, it's all of that. So that's how you calculate the energy in various drynesses of steam. This equation here is the equation that I've been talking about. This is the amount of energy required to get it up to this, and this, the x, is the dryness.
50% it would be 0 0.5, if it's 80% dry it would be 0 0.8, 20%, 0 0.2 and so on. Now this final thing down the bottom here, this one's a fairly easy one, this is just simply the specific volume of steam that you get under various conditions. At one atmosphere, one litre of water gives you about 1,700 litres of steam. You can see why this is very popular for driving steam engines. Big increases in volume. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same experiment that we've done and we're going to extend that experiment just a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this at different pressures. This is going to give us a special kind of graph. So if I do this one here at room pressure at one atmosphere, that's water boils at 100 degrees. Now if you've done the Marseille boiler you know that at higher pressures. Now this is one megapascal, so that's going to be 10 atmospheres, 10 times 100 kilopascals. Water boils at about 180 degrees. So if I do the same experiment and I warm up my water, I heat it, 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 it's going to have to get to 180 at that pressure. Before it'll boil. It goes boil, 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 and it goes, it requires a bit more energy, while well, it goes beyond this point here, and then it turns to steam. If we keep heating this, this is superheated steam, it just gets hotter and hotter. Let me do another experiment. If we go to higher pressures, it goes along where we see this starts to get less, even higher pressures still. And then finally we get a point where actually we can't go any further. If we join up the dots, we get a graph which looks something like this. Now the shape of this is quite important. So remember, this is the heating of the water side. And you can see at very high pressures, it actually takes a lot more energy to heat the water than it does at low pressures. And also this curve goes around like this we get to a point where no matter how much more energy we put in we no longer have a liquid. The pressure is so high that up here we get something which is called supercritical supercritical steam. This is superheated This area here doesn't have any particular meaning. And these are, remember, different pressures. And over here, this is all superheat. You don't have to do one atmosphere. You can go at less than one atmosphere. You can do this in vacuum, various vacuums. And you can still continue on in this form like this. So what you get is a graph which looks something like this. This is the critical point here, the critical point where you simply can't go any higher. What you've got up here in the supercritical region here is a kind of very dense gas. This region here is the superheat, where it's normal gas, but it's just extremely hot. This is the saturated vapor line, this is the point at which all of your water has been turned to steam. And remember, different places along here are different degrees of dryness. So have a little look at that there. Have a look at the comments on it. Note that this rolls off like that. Now, we come to the steam tables. Essentially what these steam tables are doing is it's bringing together all of this information. The first bits here are very much the same as the Marseille boiler experiment. This is from 0 to 100 degrees, and this little portion here is for higher temperatures and pressures. Um, let's just take this point here. This is one you'd be very familiar with. At 100 degrees, the boiling point of water is 101.3 kilopascals. Sorry, the, the pressure 
when it's boiling is 101.3. So this is normal atmosphere, that's the normal boiling point. If you start it off with water at 0 degrees, that's the amount of energy required to heat it to 100. This is the amount of energy required to heat that 100 degree water to 100 degree steam. This number here is the sum of this one plus this one. This is saying this much energy has been needed to turn a kilogram of water at 0 degrees all the way to a kilogram of steam at 100 degrees. And this is the specific volume. So this is 1.67 cubic meters per kilogram of water, which is around about 1,700 liters. At lower pressures, the volumes get much bigger. So this is low temperatures and low pressures. If we go over to here, these are higher temperatures and pressures. So for example, we can say, well, what is the um, boiling point of water at 400 uh, sorry, 400 kilopascals absolute. Well, the boiling point of water there is 144 degrees. I should say something about this. There's two pressures here. One is absolute and one is gauge. Now, if you look at a normal pressure gauge, you just plug it in, nothing's happening. It'll probably say zero. You increase the pressure and it can go to, say, 100 kilopascals and then 200, and then 300, and so on and so on. So this is a typical pressure gauge. We call this... Oh, gosh, can't spell gauge. Gauge pressure. However, although it says zero, we haven't added any extra pressure. Actually, sitting under this is a whole atmosphere of pressure the atmosphere around us. So this should really be 101.3, not zero. Close enough to 100. So absolute pressures are what the gauge says plus the atmospheric pressure. So if you just take a look at one of these here, you can see that 400 absolute is 300 gauge. We're assuming that one atmosphere is not 101.3 but it's 100 kilopascals. So that's the only difference then between the gauge pressure and the absolute pressure. Just the pressure of the atmosphere. And the way this table is made it's considered to be 100. So 250, 150 and so on and so on. So once again this and this are very very similar to what you did in the Marseille boiler experiment. You heated it up, and let's say you had heated it up to a gauge pressure of three atmospheres, you get a boiling point of 144. If you took it up to four, you would have got about 150. And then I asked you, don't go above four because the thing is um, getting a little bit old.